The best known event of the Japanese expansion program of December 1941 was the attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. However, the Japanese simultaneously attacked several other targets in the Pacific, including Wake Island, the Marshall Islands, Guam, Thailand and Malaya. Although the landings on the Malayan coast at Koto Baru are dated to the 8th of December, it actually occurred approximately one hour before the attack on Pearl Harbor commenced. The difference in dates is due to the difference in international time zones and the Pearl Harbor attack being dated to American timings. Because of this, the landings were the first Japanese attack against the Western Allies in the Second World War. The town of Koto Baru was home to an airstrip. Along with Gongedak and Machang, it formed part of the Royal Air Force and Royal Australian Air Force as bases of operations in northern Malaya. The Japanese attack intended to capture this strategic location and remove the threat of the two air forces. Also, by landing in Malaya, the Japanese would be in a position to strike at the British-controlled city of Singapore. This controlled the major shipping routes in the Malacca Straits and was also a symbol of the British Empire's dominance in the area. Singapore lay some 500 miles south of Kota Baru. Contrary to the popular perception that the British forces had no defence policies for Singapore, beyond a large naval battery that guarded the straits, the defence of Malaya was covered by Operation Matador. Operation Matador identified that the eastern coast of Siam would be the most likely area if an invasion by Japan was ever attempted. If an invasion occurred, Matador ordered a preemptive move by a small British force into Thailand, which would delay the invading force while the main British force organised for a larger attack. Unfortunately, the full complement of resources needed for such an operation were still not in place by December of 1941. Added to this, Britain had also assigned a non-aggression pact with Siam, blunting the ability of Operation Matador before it was even attempted. Despite the limitations of Operation Matador, the terrain of Kotobaru lent itself to the defender, with creeks and streams breaking up the beach area. These funnelled an attacker into previously located fire zones. Just beyond the beach, the ground was swampy, which would also help to slow an attack. The Indian 9th Division held the area, supported in part by the Australian 8th Division to the south. The main defence force on Katsubaru Beach was the Indian 3rd 17th Dogra Battalion. The British defence line also stretched some 10 miles north to south, but consisted of minefields, barbed wire belts and pillboxes, approximately 600 yards apart. Some of the pillboxes were dummies, but there were also at least two strong points in the position centre. Artillery support at Kotobaru was provided by the 21st Indian Mountain Battery and the 73rd Field Artillery Battery, both probably sited at the airfield, and ground forces were commanded by Brigadier B.W. Key. The Japanese attacking forces were drawn from the 25th Army, which was commanded by Lieutenant General Tomoyuku Yamashita. Setting sail on the 4th of December, the task force was later joined by more ships. As the invasion force made its way to the Malayan coast, it was spotted by an RAAF Lockheed Hudson, on the 7th of December, an RAF Catalina flying boat also spotted the invaders. Unfortunately, before they could report their findings, the aircraft was attacked and destroyed by five Nakajima Ki-27 fighters. Flying officer Patrick Bedell and his seven crew became the first Allied casualties in the war with Japan. Air Marshal Sir Robert Brook Popham, the Allied commanding officer in the Far East, hesitated to launch Operator Machador on the 7th of December, even with the Japanese fleet moving closer. Brooke Popham thought the Japanese were attempting to force the British to strike first and provide an excuse to go to war. With this in mind, he decided on delaying Matador for the night at least. Meanwhile, shortly after midnight on the 7th and 8th of December, the Japanese transport ships dropped anchor three kilometres offshore. The ships carried approximately 5,200 Japanese veteran soldiers of the 18th Division who had previously fought in China. Indian soldiers patrolling on the beach spotted the dark shadows of the ships and reported back to their commanders. At around half past midnight, and nearly an hour before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese ships began the bombardment of the shore, whilst the landing craft were lowered to the sea and loaded. Rough seas and bad weather capsized several smaller vessels, and some Japanese soldiers drowned. Despite this, by 12.45 the first wave of landing craft were heading towards the beach in four lines. Almost immediately, the Dogras began an intense defence of the landing sites, with fire pouring out of the pillboxes, stopping the Japanese infantry on the beach. However, hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the south of the landing zone forced a breach in the Allied defences. By dawn, the Japanese soldiers on the north were still pilled in the open and were subject to attacks from Allied aircraft causing heavy casualties. Meanwhile, the RAAF Hudson bombers flew 17 sorties against the Japanese landing craft, damaging two and setting the third ablaze. The Japanese managed to knock out the two pillboxes and trench positions, forcing the Dogras to retreat back to the airfield. 
Bringing forward his reserves, Brigadier Key attempted to retake the beach around turn 30 with a pincer attack. The attack was unsuccessful and this caused more casualties on both sides. A further attempt to close the breach in the afternoon was also a failure. In the mid-afternoon, the Japanese had landed three full infantry battalions, causing the air vehicle to be evacuated by dusk. The Japanese used a poor light to infiltrate between British defending units and threatened the stability of the defence line. With the possibility that more landings could take place elsewhere, Brigadier Key asked permission to withdraw. The 2nd 12th Frontier Force Regiment put up a brilliant defence of the town of Kotubaru on the night of the 9th, but they were unable to stop the Japanese from capturing it. Brigadier Key was granted permission to withdraw as the Japanese pressure increased, but the heavy fighting on the beach had caused 558 Japanese casualties, of which around 320 were killed. The Allied forces had 360 wounded, 37 missing and 68 killed during the landings. The way was now open for the Japanese to begin their advance down the Malayan Peninsula towards Singapore, but they claimed that the landings of Kotubaru were one of the most violent engagements in the entire Malaya campaign. Despite Japanese aggression in the Far East, it was British defence policy to make no attempt to agitate the Japanese Empire by attacking first. Added to this was the issue that the war in Europe was taking more than the lion's share of material and supplies. Southeast Asia Command were told in no uncertain terms that they were the bottom of the pile when it came to reinforcements in late 1941. However, Japan's build-up of an aggressive stance led the Royal Navy to make plans to send a balanced force to the Far East as a deterrent. This would have been made up of seven older capital ships, one aircraft carrier and 24 destroyers. Unfortunately, it would have taken until March 1942 to assemble and dispatch the fleet. Australia was also requesting the dispatch of a fleet at the soonest time possible. These factors led Churchill to consider sending a smaller force of a modern battleship, a cruiser and an aircraft carrier in October of 1941. Churchill and the Navy clashed over this difference in approach until a compromise was reached on the 20th of October. It was decided that the battleship Prince of Wales would sail to Cape Town and then another decision how to proceed would be made when it arrived in port. Ordered in 1936, the Prince of Wales had only been completely fitted out in March of 1941. She had then seen action against the Bismarck in May. The Prince of Wales mounted 10 14-inch guns at a top speed of 28.5 knots. It had limited capability against aircraft. The Prince of Wales headed out to Clyde with three destroyers and arrived in Cape Town on the 16th of November. The Admiralty made no attempt to stop the ship from continuing then onto Ceylon, where it was joined by the battlecruiser HMS Repulse and two more destroyers. Repulse was a First World War era battlecruiser mounting six 15-inch guns. It had not been updated since its launching and was totally inadequate against aircraft attacks. Despite the shortcomings of both the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, they were still a serious threat to the Japanese lines of communication in the South China Sea. The group headed by the Prince of Wales was named Force Z and consisted of two capital ships and four destroyers by the time it had reached Singapore in the late afternoon of the 2nd of December. On the 6th of December, reports of a large fleet of Japanese landing craft spotted south of Indochina indicated the beginnings of hostilities. Two days later, reports arrived of the Japanese landings in Thailand and Malaya, and Singapore was bombed where the Prince of Wales was at anchor. The scale of the Japanese attacks soon became apparent, and whilst the Admiral to decide what to do, Acting Admiral Sir Tom Phillips called a conference with his officers and they thought the best course of action would be to take the offensive against the landings in the north at Malaya and Thailand. As the force sailed from Singapore on the 8th of December, it was apparent that air cover was not going to be available and surprise would have to be the major factor in defeating the Japanese landings. Deciding that Kotobaru would be the best target, the force sailed north for 0400 hours on the 9th of December. Cover from heavy weather and the distance from the Japanese airbases also helped Phillips to take this decision. However, at 1345 hours, the Japanese submarine I-65 spotted the British ships while remaining undetected itself. Later, at 1745 hours, three Japanese aircraft were spotted tailing the force. Changing course to the northwest at 1855 hours, the British ships then came within 22 miles of the Imperial Japanese Navy task force that was searching for Force Z. At 2000 hours, Phillips conferred with his senior staff and decided they would abort the mission to Kotubaro and head south to Singapore, now some 275 miles south. To further add to the dilemma of where best to move the fleet, a report reached Force said that a landing had taken place at Kwantan, only 120 miles from their present location. The report was false, but unknowingly, Phillips decided to investigate and changed course at 052 hours on the 10th of December. At 0800 hours, Force said dispatched an aircraft and a destroyer to investigate the landing report. Nothing was found, but Force said lingered for another 90 minutes investigating reports of other boats in the area. 
At 10.15 hours, a Japanese aircraft was spotted, followed by an attack wave at 1100 hours. The Japanese had failed to contact the British ships on the surface, so had dispatched nearly 100 torpedo bombers and light bombers from Indochina to find Force Z. The aircraft had flown almost to Singapore without detecting the British ships. Turning back north, some of the aircraft spotted Force Z around 1100 hours. The planes were spread out from searching, and the attack developed into a series of waves of G3M Nels and G4M Bettys. The first attack was from eight Nels dropping 550 pound bombs, doing some damage and causing a fire on the Prince of Wales. The British anti aircraft fire was heavy and damaged five of the attacking planes. A second attack was made up of 17 torpedo carrying Nels, again against the Prince of Wales. The Japanese claimed three torpedo hits, but the British only confirmed two. However, the hits buckled the propeller and flooded several compartments, listing the ship and slowing her speed. The damage also meant the loss of the main anti aircraft guns. Repulse was also attacked by nine aircraft, though no hits were recorded. A third attacked wave zeroed in on the Repulse, but again was successful in striking the ship. Then the following wave, comprising of 26 Bettys, attacked both ships. Six attacked the crippled Prince of Wales, and 20 launching against the Repulse. The Repulse was attacked in a pincer manoeuvre by the Japanese planes. Five torpedoes slammed into the ship, and it sank at 12.33 hours. Another wave of nine Japanese aircraft concentrated on the escorting destroyers, none of which were hit. The final attack from seven Nels focused back on the Prince of Wales. All seven planes dropped 1,100 pound bombs, one of which hit and caused a severe explosion on the main deck. The Prince of Wales was listing badly and speed had been reduced to five knots. The order to abandon ship was given at 13.15 hours and five minutes later the ship had sunk. The three remaining destroyers began the task of rescuing the survivors of the two ships. The Japanese aircraft had begun their return flight to the air bases, so the rescue went unmolested. From the repulse, 513 crew were lost, with 796 rescued. The Prince of Wales lost 327 men, with 1,285 being rescued. Three Japanese aircraft were lost, along with 21 crew, and 27 aircraft were damaged in the attack. The sinking of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse was a major blow to the British Navy, and brought about the end of British naval dominance in the Far East. Phillips would later become vilified for his actions, based on his lack of combat experience. He had a good knowledge of naval matters and the effects of air power against ships and the difficulty of his mission in the Far East, where naval power was paramount. The full nature of Japanese air power was unknown to Phillips and the Royal Navy in general, yet the threat was judged to be unimpressive by both. This was supported by the fact that the Prince of Wales had previously been attacked by Italian torpedo bombers and had repulsed them. Also, judging by the performance of existing British torpedo bombers, it was thought that if Force Z stayed 400 miles from the Japanese air bases in Indochina, they would be relatively safe from air attack. All of these factors were at play when Phillips ordered Force Z to sail, and he is being judged unfairly, as he was only acting on what he thought was the best course of action with an inadequate force, and his senior staff had agreed. The decision to send Force Z to Singapore as a deterrent against an expansionist imperial power was Churchill's and Churchill's alone, and because of this, the sinking of the ships was squarely his responsibility. The Japanese plan to conquer Malaya and Singapore in December 1941 meant the capture of two landing points. The first at Kotubaru in northern Malaya was defended by Australian and Indian forces, but the Japanese knew that the Patani and Singora in South Thailand were held by the Thai army, who would offer little resistance. Here, the Japanese were also reliant on Britain not advancing into Thailand to repulse the landings. The 5th Division of the Imperial Japanese 25th Army was tasked with taking these two landing points. Seizure of the ports would enable a quick build-up of land forces, and capturing the nearby airfields would allow for the Japanese 3rd Air Division to establish themselves to support the ground troops. Once ashore, the 5th Division would split its attack, with the 9th Brigade advancing against Harold Sar and the 42nd Infantry Regiment moving on to Crow. This would capture the line of the Perak River and allow for more air bases to fall into Japanese hands. After this initial objective had been taken, the advance on Kuala Lumpur could begin. Yamashita, commander of the 25th Army, was aware that speed was of the essence and a build-up of supply would not be possible once the landings had taken place. On the 8th of December, the two Japanese forces landed in Thailand and Malaya. Landing at Kotubaru, the Japanese forces got ashore despite resistance from the Indian defenders. Meanwhile, as expected, the landings of Patani were largely unopposed. As the Japanese landed, there was confusion in the 3rd Indian Corps whether to enact Operation Matador. Operation Matador was a British defence plan to invade Thailand in the event of a Japanese attack, and the confusion meant that the Indians delayed their advance. 
Despite pushing aside Thai resistance and roadblocks, the Indians only managed to advance 30 miles. Meanwhile, the Japanese had advanced 75 miles in 60 hours and smashed into the Indian soldiers, stopping them dead. With Matador dead in the water, the 11th Indian Division moved south to the road junction of Jitra. The area around Jitra had been prepared by the Indian soldiers, but had taken a lower priority than the preparations for Matador. Heavy rain also hampered the preparations. Although the position at Jitra was not ideal for defence, it was north of the airfield of Alostar which had to be defended. Unfortunately, unknown to the commander of the Indian 3rd Corps, Lieutenant General Sir Lewis Heath, the RAF had already abandoned the base on the 9th of December. The British defence would be for nothing. On the 11th of December, the Japanese advance guard initially made contact with the Indian 1st 14th Punjabs. This was a covering force which withdrew in the face of opposition. This battalion was then reinforced by the 2nd 1st Gurkha Rifles Battalion, with the intention to hold the Japanese north of Jitra until the 12th. However, heavy rain and poor visibility meant that the Japanese armour and motorised infantry scattered both units with frontal attacks and flanking manoeuvres. The next day, the 1st 14th Punjabs were only able to count 200 men amongst their number. The initial contact was a huge blow for the British defence, losing two combat battalions immediately. The Japanese column continued its advance down the road towards the main position of the 15th Indian Brigade. This was led by two Type 95 light tanks and ten Type 97 medium tanks of the 1st Tank Regiment, along with elements of the 5th Reconnaissance Regiment. During the night of the 11th, the Japanese reached the main defence line north of Jitra, and the initial probing attack cost them two tanks. However, the 2nd 9th Jats on the British right flank received confusing reports that they had been flanked. This led to them being reinforced by two battalions of the 6th Brigade. Another Japanese attack at 0300 hours on the 12th was repulsed, and the situation restored by a British counter-attack. Three hours later, another Japanese attack in driving rain struck the junction of the 1st Leicesters and 2nd 9th Jats battalions. This attack achieved a penetration into the British defence line. The 1st 8th Punjabs counter-attacked, but it was ill-coordinated and easily repulsed by the Japanese with heavy losses, including the battalion commander. East of the road, the Japanese overran a company of 2nd 9th Jats and got as far as a reserve position of the 2nd 2nd Gurkhas at the water feature of Sungai Bata. The British divisional commander, Major General David Murray Lyon, requested a withdrawal south to defensive position at Gurun, some 30 miles away. He had no reserves, a dispirited division faced with a tank attack, and feared his lines of communication would be cut with the Japanese advancing towards Crow. However, Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, General Officer Commanding, refused the request and ordered Murray Lyon to hold at Chitra. Despite this, the brigade commanders decided that they would already start to withdraw to the Sungai Bata. The 1st Leicesters began their withdrawal at 1600 hours and were joined by the 2nd 9th Jats. False reports that the Japanese tanks were in the rear quickly turned this withdrawal into a rout. This confirmed Murray Lyon's fears that the division could be destroyed and requested a withdrawal again at 1930 hours. It was approved, but by this time the rain was still falling heavily and the withdrawal would have to have been executed by poorly trained troops on a single road. Despite these setbacks, the 11th Indian Division was able to break contact with the Japanese, but with the heavy loss of men and material. The British withdrawal on the 12th of December ended the Battle of Jitra. An entire British division and prepared positions had been attacked and defeated by a battalion of Japanese supported by a company of tanks. Most of the units in the 11th Division had suffered heavily, losing both men and material. Divisional morale had also taken a heavy hit. Over the next few days, as the division fell back to the unprepared position at Gurun, the Japanese harried the British, giving them no rest. Unfortunately, this was only a sign of things to come over the next few weeks in Malaya. After the defeat of the Allied forces at Jitra, the Japanese 5th Infantry Division pursued the beleaguered defenders south on the 13th of December 1941. Confusion reigned as the Allies fell back, made worse by Japanese snipers. These men had infiltrated the rear areas wearing Malay dress and added to the chaos. At Alo Star, the bridges across the Kedo River were hastily prepared for demolition on the night of the 12th and the 13th. The railway bridge failed to fall and an armoured train was ordered to run over it to help collapse the structure. Unfortunately, the train jumped the broken rails and steamed off to the south. It finally reached Taiping before stopping. Soon after their arrival, the Japanese vanguard attacked across the Kedo River, and only a counter-attack from the 2nd 9th Gurkha rifles drove them back. The British commander, Major General Murray Lyon, decided that the Allied troops were in no condition to stand and fight against an attack in strength, and ordered the continual withdrawal south. This began on the evening of the 13th of December in driving rain and along packed roads. The rear battalion of 6th Brigade, the 1st 8th Punjab, were not able to cover the 20 miles until midday on the 14th. 
and when they arrived at Gurun they were hungry and weary. The Gurun position lay astride the main road south and the railway. On the west the Kedah peak rose some 4,000 feet and the area to the east was covered in thick jungle. Gurun had been identified before the war as a defensive position and was to be prepared by civilian labour, but the speed of the Allied retreat meant that this just was not possible. Unfortunately for the tired troops arriving in the area, they had to begin digging in. 11th Division placed the 6th Brigade on the left covering the trunk road and the railway, with the right flank covered by 28th Brigade. 15th Brigade had been reduced to around 600 men was placed in reserve. Artillery support came from the 88th Field Regiment and three anti-tank batteries. The jungle, plantations and peak seriously restricted observation and the field of fire. At around 2pm on the 14th, the Allied troops had barely taken their positions when the first Japanese forces arrived at the crossroads in trucks. They were supported by three tanks. This was a great surprise to the defenders who thought the destruction of the bridges to the north would have kept the armour out of the campaign for a few more days. The tanks were engaged by the anti-tank guns, one was hit, forcing the other two to withdraw. At 4pm, the reinforced Japanese infantry made an attack, capturing the crossroads and pushing into the 1st 8th Punjab. The Indians were shaky, but Brigadier Lay organised a counter-attack, leading it himself and restoring the position. Meanwhile, Murray Lyon was in a conference with Lieutenant General Heath, commander of the 3rd Indian Corps. Murray Lyon was arguing that his formations wouldn't last long fighting a piecemeal defence, and requested that the retreat should be in longer bounds, using motor vehicles if possible. Heath agreed, but emphasised the need to hold the Japanese at the present position. Back at Gurun, Brigadier Lay planned a counter-attack by a company of the East Surreys to drive the enemy from the crossroads on the first light of the 15th. However, the Japanese barraged the Allied lines at 1.30am and drove an attack into the right of the 1st 8th Punjabs. They infiltrated deep into the 6th Brigade's area. The headquarters of 2nd East Surreys was overrun, and the commanding officer was killed along with five other officers, along with the 6th Brigade headquarters being wiped out. Brigadier Lay only survived because he was absent from the headquarters. The commanding officer of the Punjabis believed that his right flank had been overrun and he was isolated from the East Surreys. He ordered the battalion to withdraw towards Yen and the coastal road. Taking a company of the East Surreys, the move left the trunk road and the western position completely undefended. Fortunately, Brigadier William Carpendale of 28th Brigade managed to hold the enemy around Gurun using his brigade and the 15th Brigade. On the morning of the 15th of December, Murray Lyon visited his forward brigades and immediately saw that the tactical situation was becoming untenable. He ordered a withdrawal immediately seven miles south of Gurun to a position held by the 1st Independent Company and a squadron of 3rd Cavalry. Only 28th Brigade could now be relied on as a fighting formation and the entire division was withdrawn to the Muda River during the night of the 15th and 16th. Fortunately, the Japanese did not pursue too closely, having taken heavy casualties in the fighting of the Kedah Peak. Gurun was only a small action in the general retreat of the Allied Army in Malaya, but it involved more loss of men and equipment, and had a demoralising effect on the British and Indian soldiers, as they were pushed south by the unseemingly stoppable Japanese invasion. The Japanese landings on the Malayan coast in December of 1941 had struck a blow to the Allied Army. They were pushed quickly down the west coast of the peninsula and the Allies suffered defeat after defeat and were forced into a fighting withdrawal. After being defeated at the battles of Jitter and Gurun, the 11th Indian Division continued to retreat south along the west coast of Malaya. The Japanese 5th Division were in close pursuit and were aiming to strike at Kuala Lumpur. The Allied defenders were faced with a difficult decision of defending the RAF base at Kuala Lumpur to stop it falling into Japanese control and also allowing the Indian 9th Division on the east coast of Malaya to move south. The position at Kampar offered a good defence. The ridges of Tonson, Kennedy and Cemetery overlooked the main road south and provide important strategic value. The ridges sat on the Gurung Urjang Malacca, a 4,000 foot high limestone hill overlooking the swampy plains that surrounded it. The capture of the town of Kampar would allow the Japanese a foothold into the Kinta Valley to the south, so it was imperative that it was held. To give the 11th Division time to reorganise and prepare their positions at Kampar, they were replaced by the 12th Indian Division, who were trained in jungle fighting and performed a fighting retreat against the Japanese vanguard. In the previous week's fighting, the 11th Division had been badly mauled, and as a consequence, the 15th and 6th Brigades were merged into one another. The new brigade consisted of the 1st Leicestershire's and the 2nd East Surreys, who had been formed into the British Battalion. Added to this was the composite Jat Punjab Regiment, formed of the two Indian battalions. Even with the 1st 14th Punjab, 5th 14th Punjab and 2nd 16th Punjab battalions, the entire 15th 6th Brigade only numbered about 1,600 men. 
The 28th Gurkha Brigade had also suffered badly at the hands of the Japanese, and the three battalions had taken heavy casualties in the previous fighting. Commanding the 11th Division was Major General Archibald Paris. He had taken over command after Major General Murray Lyon was sacked by Lieutenant General Percival on the 23rd of December for his failure to hold the Japanese advance. Paris's task was to defend a line from the coast to Kampar town. Artillery spotters were placed on the hillside overlooking the Japanese advance. The 12th Brigade was placed on the west to cover the coast and the line of retreat. On the 30th of December, the Japanese began their probing attacks on the Kampar position. The Japanese 5th Division was commanded by Lieutenant General Takura Mutsai, and their vanguard of the attack was spearheaded by the 9th Brigade and the 11th and the 41st Regiments. The 41st Regiment was still relatively fresh and intact, and numbered about 4,000 men. The Japanese intended on capturing the Kampar position as a New Year present for Emperor Hirohito. They began their main attack on the 31st of December by probing the Allied right flank and the 28th Gurkha positions. Throughout the 31st, the well-concealed Gurkhas fought off the attacks with artillery covering fire from the 155th Field Artillery Regiment. At midnight, the artillery commander, Lieutenant Colonel August Murdoch, ordered a 12-gun salute to be fired at the Japanese to celebrate the new year. At 7 in the morning, the Japanese 41st Regiment began its attack on the western side of the position. This attack fell on the British battalion, with the position being taken and retaken in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Fresh Japanese soldiers were pushed into the fight, but were still unable to dislodge the well-concealed and dug-in allied defenders. The defenders were not relieved during the following two days, but held on to their positions despite the continual Japanese assault. Thirty men of the Leicesters, commanded by Lieutenant Edgar Newland, were surrounded and cut off for most of the battle. They held their position, fighting off all Japanese attacks. Newland was awarded the Military Cross for his part in the action. After the failure of two previous attacks, 60 Sikhs and Gujars of the Jap Punjab Battalion attacked Japanese soldiers who had captured trenches on the Thompson Ridge. Captain John Graham and Lieutenant Charles Lamb ordered the half company to fix bayonets and charge the position. The Japanese fire was so heavy that Lamb and 32 men were killed. Graham was wounded but continued the charge until a grenade mangled his legs below the knees. However, he continued to shout encouragement to the attackers and throw grenades at the Japanese positions. Despite the loss of 34 Indians, they took the position. Graham died of his wounds a day later and was mentioned in dispatches. The position at Kampar was too strong for the Japanese to take, and it was decided that an outflanking mover by landing on the coast and taking Telok Ansan, where the 12th Brigade were positioned, would be the best way forward. This would also cut off the line of retreat for the 11th Brigade. The 11th Regiment made the landings and was supported by the Imperial Guard Division heading overland following the Perak River south. A brisk battle with the Allied 3rd Cavalry and Independent Brigade saw Telok Ansem taken on the 2nd of January. Despite the 12th Brigade holding the line of the north-south road, Paris realised his rear was under threat and abandoned the positions at Kampar to fall back further south to new positions at the Slim River. The battle at Kampar had lasted for four days and was the first major defeat of the Japanese Imperial Army during the invasion of Malaya. The 41st Regiment were so badly mauled during the action that they were unable to take part in the later attack on Singapore. Japanese newspapers later reported the Japanese army losses at about 500 men, with the Allies losing about 150 men, but there were no other official casualty reports. The main thrust of the Japanese invasion of Malaya in 1941 was directed against the Allied units holding the west coast of the peninsula. This was where the road system was most extensive and made for rapid advances. The east coast was dominated by thick jungle, and the commander of Japanese 25th Army, General Yamashita, had planned a surprise landing at Kuantan to avoid the difficult terrain. Two battalions of the 55th Regiment were earmarked to land at Kuantan on the 28th of December to capture the airfield and to allow for forward operations from the supporting Japanese aircraft. However, Yamashita considered that the air power of the Allies had not yet been reduced sufficiently to allow for an unmolested sea passage, and the amphibious operation was postponed. Meanwhile, the Japanese 56th Infantry Regiment had made good progress down the east coast, capturing Koala Krai on the 19th of December, and making contact with the Indian forces around Guantan on the 23rd. With these events, Yamashita considered that it was possible to capture Guantan by land, and the 55th Regiment's seaborne assault was cancelled. Instead, they were now to be landed at Kotobaru on the 30th of December, and followed the 56th Regiment down the coast. The airfield at Kwantan was about 9 miles from the coast, and close to the main north-south road. 
Tasked with defending the airfield was the Allied 22nd Brigade of the 9th Division, commanded by Brigadier Painter. Their defence lines stretched from the mouth of the river to stop a seaborne attack, with other positions designed to halt an advance from the north. The 2nd 18th Royal Guahali Rifles, supported by a company of 2nd 12th Frontier Force Regiment, held the beach defences in an 11 mile long front from Kwantan. The 5th 11 Sikhs held the line of the river and the rest of the 2nd 12th Frontier Force was held in reserve at Gambang on the Gerantut Road. Artillery support came from the 5th and 88th Field Regiments. The withdrawal on the west coast led General Heath, commander of 3rd Indian Corps, to believe that 9th Division could be used to attack the Japanese flank in a counterstroke using the lateral roads on the peninsula. Due to this, there was considerable anxiety about allowing 22nd Brigade to defend Kuantan Airfield. The airfield was of diminishing usefulness to the RAF, and Heath suggested to General Barstow of the 9th Division that the soldiers defending the area should be withdrawn as soon as a threat from the north developed, leaving only outposts and patrols. However, at a conference on the 28th of December, Painter argued that a repositioning of his defence line would help deny the airfield to the Japanese, and any last-minute change in their plans would also be dangerous. Barstow agreed, and the only change in the plan was for the reserve battalion of the Guahalis to cover Jabor Valley. However, things changed at a higher level, and Heath wrote to Barstow with orders from General Percival that the survival of the 22nd Brigade was more important than the defence of the airfield. Therefore, Painter was to take up new positions to avoid the brigade from being destroyed. On the 30th of December, the Guahalis were ordered to withdraw to cover the river in an outpost position, while all the guns and transports were to use the ferry to cross the river that night. Meanwhile, the Japanese attacked down the Jabor Valley and overran the left flank of the Guahalis. Two companies were cut off and the rest of the battalion were driven east of the river, where they were able to organise a weak line of outposts. Japanese aircraft attacked the ferry, but the guns and transports were able to get across during the night. On the 31st, Painter proposed to move his force towards Moran to preserve his strength. However, confusingly, he was ordered to hold the airfield as it was thought that reinforcements were en route and their safe arrival would be hampered if the enemy had it under control. Painter's force subsequently moved to new positions on the airfield's perimeter, with the Garhalis crossing the river in great difficulty. They were now only at a strength of about 300 men. On the 1st of January, Painter was then told that he was to hold the airfield for as long as possible and for a period of at least five days. Meanwhile, the Japanese had crossed the river on the 1st and 2nd of January and began infiltrating the defence perimeter. This made it clear that the 22nd Brigade would be heavily engaged if they were to hold the airfield. This was confounded by the withdrawal on the west coast of the 11th Division from Kampar. The withdrawal on the west had an impact on the strategic position of 9th Division on the east coast and it was imperative that the 9th Division was now concentrated further south, ready for a withdrawal off the Malaya Peninsula. So, on the 2nd, and as the airfield could not be held for long, Heath ordered the 22nd Brigade to abandon their positions and begin the withdrawal south to Gerundatut. The buildings and airfield installations were destroyed, and the Brigade made preparations to withdraw on the 3rd. However, at 8pm on the 3rd, the Japanese attacked in strength against the 2nd 12th Frontier Force, who were acting as rear guard. The Japanese infiltrated behind the frontier force and put up roadblocks, forcing them to fight through to the rest of the Allied units. Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Cumming and 40 men fought their way through at close quarters to rejoin the rest of 22nd Brigade. The men, trapped behind enemy lines, could not be rescued, as the need to preserve the brigade was far greater than any attempt to save them. The retirement of the brigade continued the following day, and by the night of the 6th and 7th of January, the 22nd Brigade crossed Gerentut's ferry with about two-thirds of its original strength. After the loss of Kwantan and continued withdrawal of the Allied forces on the western coast of the Malaya Peninsula, 9th Division was ordered to join West Force to take up new positions in northern Johor. It reached these positions on the 13th of January with heavy losses. The defence of Kwantan was hampered by contradictory orders and confusion as to where the 22nd Brigade's positions should be. With the collapse of the Allied line on the west coast of the peninsula, it was apparent that the Kwantan position was untenable, and had a withdrawal been made earlier, more of the 22nd Brigade may have been preserved. However, this conclusion is drawn with the benefit of hindsight, and the situation on the ground was a rapidly changing one with the speed of the Japanese advance confounding matters. After the rapid Japanese advance down the Malayan Peninsula in December of 1941, the Allied defenders had held out for four days at the position at Kampar. However, by the 2nd of January 1942, they had been outflanked by the Japanese landings and capture of Telok Anson. This had put the defence line of the 11th Indian Division in jeopardy and threatened to cut off the road to Singapore. The division fell back south 
to prepared positions of Trolak, five miles north of the Slim River. The position at Trolak was centred on the road which cut through the impenetrable jungle to open out to several estates and rubber plantations. The 11th Division had lost one of its brigades to defend the coast on the west and also to rest and reorganise. The remaining two brigades were the 12th Indian Brigade and the 28th Gurkha Brigade. Both of these had suffered heavy casualties in the previous week's fighting. The 12th Brigade was spread along the north-south road, with the 4th 19th Hyderabad Battalion to the north, blocking the road with roadblocks and other anti-tank obstacles. The 5th 2nd Punjabs held the only other prepared positions to the south, and then behind them were the 2nd Argyll and Southern Highlanders, who had no fixed anti-tank obstacles. The 28th Gurkha Brigade was spread out to the east along the road and in defence of the Slim River Bridges, which had also been prepared for demolition. The Japanese were from Colonel Ando's group and consisted of the 42nd Infantry Regiment of the 5th Infantry Division. The Japanese forward units reached the British positions in the afternoon of the 5th of January and began a probing attack. This was beaten off by the Hyderabads with the loss of 60 Japanese. Colonel Ando decided to wait for his armour support to arrive. This force consisted of 17 Type 97 medium tanks and 3 Type 95 Hako light tanks, commanded by Major Toyosaku Shimada. Shimada's tanks arrived on the 6th of January, and he begged Ando to allow him to attack directly down the road, rather than the usual Japanese tactic of an outflanking manoeuvre. At 3.30am on the 7th of January, the tanks began their attack under the cover of artillery and mortar fire, and also in heavy rain. Although one tank was lost to the defenders' artillery fire, the Japanese tanks bypassed the roadblocks, and their supporting infantry from the 42nd Regiment scattered the Hyderabads, forcing them into the jungle. By 4am, the Japanese attack had breached the first line of the Allied defence. The 5th 2nd Punjabs were alerted to the attack by a few Hyderabads falling back, and were able to destroy three of the Japanese tanks with landmines, anti-tank fire and a Molotov cocktail attack. This caused a roadblock in the form of burning hulks, and the advance temporarily halted. Had the Allied units been able to contact their artillery support at this point, the attack may have been stopped completely. However, the communication lines had been cut and this golden opportunity was lost. Despite valiant fighting on the part of the Punjabs, the Japanese tanks pushed through their position at 6am. An unguarded sidetrack allowed the tanks to move past the burning vehicles blocking the road. By 6.30am, the Japanese armour made contact with the next defending unit, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. These were very experienced in jungle fighting and were considered the best troops in the Malaya campaign. However, the first four approaching tanks were mistaken for the universal carriers of the retreating Punjabs, and this mistake allowed the tanks to cut the battalion in half. The arrival of the remaining tanks and the Japanese infantry forced the Argyles into having to fight in small separate groups. Despite this setback, they fought ferociously and held the Japanese advance up longer than the previous two battalions, until about 7.30am. The force on the eastern side of the road, C and B companies, tried to outflank the Japanese by heading through the rubber plantation and heading south. Six weeks later, some of the men were still in the jungle, having broken into smaller groups. A company on the west of the road managed to break away from the Japanese. D company suffered the same fate as C and B, being scattered into the jungle. Unfortunately, most of the men from D company were captured before they could fully escape. On the 8th of January, only 94 Argyles answered roll call. The Japanese then divided the captured British soldiers into two groups, those who could walk and those who were too wounded. The latter group was executed and the survivors were forced to dig the grave and carry the Japanese wounded. Meanwhile, the Japanese tanks continued their advance down the road and smashed straight into Lieutenant Colonel Cyril Stokes' 5th 14th Punjabs, who were in marching order up the road. The three leading tanks, commanded by Lieutenant Watanabe, had the perfect target and machine gunned the lined up Punjabs. Stokes was mortally wounded and the battalion suffered heavy casualties which only mustered 146 officers and men on the 8th of January. By 8am the Japanese tanks were in the 28th Brigade's HQ area, scattering the 2nd 2nd and 2nd 9th Gurkhas. Despite no warning of the attack these two battalions were able to escape across the river before the main Japanese force arrived. Not so lucky were the 2nd 1st Gurkhas who were also marching along the road when the Japanese found them. The column was facing away from the line of attack and they were caught in the rear with an even higher death toll than the Punjabis. The following day, only one officer and 27 other ranks answered the roll call. The Japanese had broken through two brigades and was in the rear areas of 11th Division causing chaos. They were also heading for the important bridges over the Slim River, the road and rail bridges. 
The road bridge was only defended by a Bofors anti-aircraft battery whose guns couldn't penetrate the tank armour. The crews of the guns fled and the tank commander Watanabe cut the cords of the demolition charges on the bridge with his sword. It was 8.30am and in five hours of fighting the Japanese had captured two bridges intact and scattered the entire 11th Indian Division. A force of three tanks under Ensign Sato was sent to push further along the road until they encountered the 155th Artillery Regiment. One gun was destroyed, but the second managed to fire at and destroy Sato's tank, killing him and forcing the remaining tanks to retreat back to the road bridge. 11th Division suffered a huge defeat at the Slim River. Approximately 3,200 casualties and a huge amount of irreplaceable equipment was lost. The Japanese attack had cut through 19 miles of jungle road and captured bridges with minimal cost to themselves. 12th Brigade barely existed and 28th Brigade was but a shadow of its former self. Some of the Argyles who had been scattered into the jungle were still missing in 1945, and one Gurkha NCO, Naik Nakam Nagurung, was found in October 1949, having been living in the jungle since 1942. The Battle of Slim River saw the less of central Malaya and the Allied units fall back south to defend Singapore. After the disaster at the Slim River, General Archibald Wavell took up command of the American, British, Dutch, Australian command to protect the Southeast Asian region against the widespread Japanese advances. The defence line of Timor, Java, southern Sumatra and Singapore was imperative in this and the naval and air bases would have to be held until the end of January at least, when reinforcements would be available. Meanwhile, in Malaya, the troops of the Allied Third Corps had been fighting and retreating for over a month. The land to the south of Kuala Lumpur was unsuited to defence and the Corps would disintegrate completely if they were left in the front line. The only way to avoid this was a withdrawal to Johor to allow troops to refit and to rest for the defence of Singapore. Although the strategy would allow the Japanese to easily take large swathes of land, the situation was desperate and there was little choice left to the Allied command. With the 11th Indian Division falling back south, the Japanese captured Kuala Lumpur on the 11th of January, completing this phase of the Japanese 25th Army plan for the invasion of Malaya. Despite efforts to move 3rd Corps stores and supplies to Singapore, the collapse at Slim River had offered very little time for this, and much of it remained in Kuala Lumpur where it was seized by the Japanese. Even with this setback, 3rd Corps were able to reach the positions allotted to it for the defence of Johor on the 13th of January. Meanwhile, the Japanese changed their plans for a seaboard landing in the light of the Allied retreat and the consequent capture of Kuala Lumpur. The lull allowed the 5th Infantry Division to rest on the 14th of January, while the Mokedi detachment was sent south to gain touch with the Allies. This detachment consisted of a battalion of bicycle-mounted troops and a regiment of tanks, along with some artillery and engineer support. Over on the Allied side of the lines, the 8th Australian Division, newly arrived from Singapore, took over the immediate defence of Northern Johor, while 3rd Corps passed through and prepared for the defence of Southern Johor. Not only would the formation be rested, but this would also allow for the building of a new defence line north to the island of Singapore. Major General Gordon Bennett was handed command of what was named West Force. This consisted of the 8th Australian Division, 9th Indian Division and 45th Indian Brigade to handle the defence. Bennett had placed the 27th Australian Brigade astride the Gemas Trunk Road because this offered it a good place for an ambush against any advancing Japanese forces. The Australians were covering 700 yards of the road, with a company of the 2nd 30th Battalion covering the bridge in thick jungle. Artillery was also prepared to cover the road west of the bridge. At 4pm on the 14th, the bicycles and the Mukaidi detachment reached the bridge. The Australians allowed large numbers of the Japanese soldiers to cross over the bridge before destroying the structure with previously placed demolitions. Unfortunately, the communications wires connecting the ambush position with the artillery had been cut and no supporting fire was forthcoming. Despite this, the Australian infantry fire caused huge casualties on the unsuspecting Japanese troops and within 20 minutes of the engagement starting it was over with the Australian soldiers withdrawing back to their battalion at Gemas. The next morning saw Japanese bombers attack Gemas, followed by Japanese soldiers attacking at 10am, four miles west of the town. During the course of the day's fighting, the Australians put up a good defence, repulsing several attacks, then throwing the Japanese into confusion by a well-conducted counter-attack. The Australians had destroyed several Japanese tanks and caused a large loss to the attackers. However, it was clear that the Japanese were being steadily reinforced and the position was becoming untenable. In the evening of the 16th of January, the 2nd 30th Battalion was withdrawn to the 27th Brigade's positions covering Batu Anam, 
The Australians had taken 81 casualties, causing around 1,000 casualties on the Japanese infantry and also destroying six tanks. The stiff resistance west of Gemas forced the Japanese to rethink their tactical situation, with the 9th Infantry Brigade ordered to attack the Allied units at Bataanum, while the 21st Infantry Brigade was sent to attack Segamat. The engagement at Gemas was an Allied tactical victory due to the freshness of the Australian defenders and the use of ambush tactics. Despite this brief glimmer of hope, the Japanese pressure ultimately decided the day. The Japanese invasion of Malaya had been a steady advance of victory upon victory, with very few exceptions until the clash with the Australian 2nd 30th Battalion at Gemas on the 14th of January 1942. The Australian ambush had caused large casualties on the Mukaidi detachments, but Japanese reinforcements had caused the ambushes to fall back onto their brigade positions. While the Australians held the area to the east, the coastal area around the town of Muar was held by the Indian 45th Brigade, supported by a single battery of artillery. This position was held by three battalions, but they were spread out from the coast into the jungle, and this had an impact on their communication lines. The 45th Brigade was part of General Gordon Bennett's West Force. Reinforcements had also arrived in the form of the British 53rd Infantry Brigade. This formation had been at sea for 11 weeks, and was unfit for deployment immediately. Facing the defence line was the advancing Imperial Guard Division commanded by General Nishimura. The 4th and 5th Guards Regiments approached Mio from the north, whilst the battalion-sized force commanded by Colonel Ogaki approached from the sea. During the night of 15th of January, the Japanese captured boats and barges from the southern banks of the Mio River. These boats were then packed with soldiers who crossed the river with no resistance, except for an exchange of shots with an Indian patrol. The patrol didn't alert the Muar garrison to the presence of the Japanese soldiers, and as day broke on the 16th, several other Indian companies were either routed or captured by the Japanese. An entire division of Japanese soldiers had crossed the river without the garrison realising the danger. By noon, the Japanese were attacking Muar town from upstream and threatening the garrison's lines of communication, and the 4th 9th Jat Regiment, which was the only local reserve located near Bakri. In Muar town, the Japanese attempt to seize the harbour was repulsed by Australian artillery, which fired at the packed junks and barges as they crossed the river mouth. The Japanese had made another landing further upstream and were already infiltrating into Muar town itself by mid-afternoon. In the fighting, the commanders and officers of the Rajputana and Royal Gawal rifles had been killed, leaving the young sepoys leaderless. Added to this, a Japanese air raid destroyed the 45th Brigade headquarters, killing all but two of the officers. The commander of 45th Brigade, Brigadier Herbert Duncan, was concussed but was one of the men who survived. With the destruction of the headquarters and the brigadier being concussed, commander of the 45th Brigade was temporarily taken over by Anderson of the 2nd 19th Australian Battalion. By nightfall on the 16th of January, the Japanese had captured Muar Town and the harbour whilst the remnants of 45th Brigade retreated down the coast several kilometres. The Japanese wasted no time and organised ambush positions to the south of the town in case of any counter-attacks. On the 17th of January, the remaining units of the 45th Brigade, with the 2nd 19th and the 2nd 29th Australian Battalions, as reinforcements were dispatched to recapture Muar. The Allies rallied around Bakri and threw up a rough perimeter defence. Brigadier Duncan, backing command of the 45th Brigade, planned a three-pronged advance against the town on the main road, coastal road and the jungle island. However, the 45th ran into one of the Japanese ambush locations and the attack was cancelled. At 6.45 in the morning on the 18th, General Nishimura ordered a three-pronged attack against Bakri. This was spearheaded by eight Type 95 Hago light tanks, commanded by Captain Gutanda. Defending the road was the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion, with three companies and two anti-tank guns waiting in the rubber plantations. Taking his inspiration from the successful tank attack at the Slim River, Captain Gutanda advanced with 12th Infantry support against the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion. The first wave of five tanks attacked under the cover of mortar fire. Three were immediately engaged by the forward gun but continued their attack. The anti-tank rounds passed straight through the tanks, so Sergeant Thornton, commanding the forward gun, switched to high explosive shells, which destroyed three of the Japanese tanks. With support from the 2nd anti-tank gun, commanded by Sergeant Parsons, the final two tanks were destroyed and the escaping crew were machine gunned by a Vickers. At 7.15, three more tanks advanced, undeterred by the previous failed attack. These three also came under fire from the Australian anti-tank guns and were soon destroyed. As a result of the action, Sergeant Clary Thornton was mentioned in dispatches and Sergeant Charles Parsons was awarded the DCM for their part in stopping the Japanese advance.
Thornton's gun had fired over 70 rounds during the fighting. However, the commander of 2nd 29th Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel John Robertson, was killed in the engagement. The Japanese were not expecting to lose a company of tanks that morning, and without the support of armour, the Japanese infantry were unable to break through the Australian lines. However, despite this local Allied victory, the Japanese were making gains elsewhere. On the 19th of January, the Japanese were in action on the main road and had almost surrounded the 45th Brigade. The line of retreat for the 45th Brigade was covered by the 6th Norfolk Battalion of the 53rd British Brigade on the ridge, about 8 kilometres west of Yongpeng. A Japanese attack by two battalions of the 4th Imperial Guards drove the defenders from their positions. The Norfolks had no wireless and were unable to inform their headquarters of their new positions on the North Ridge. At dawn on the next day, the 3rd 16th Punjabs were ordered to take back control of the Japanese positions. The Punjabs were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Henry Moorhead. As they advanced, they came under fire from the Norfolks, who had mistaken them for Japanese soldiers. Heavy casualties were caused before the confusion was sorted out, and then the Japanese attacked the ridge before a proper defence could be organised. Moorhead was killed, and the Norfolks and Indians were pushed off their positions once again. The Japanese capture of the ridges threatened to cut off 45th Brigade and the two Australian battalions. Later on that day, Brigadier Duncan was killed whilst commanding the rear guard and leading a bayonet charge to recover captured vehicles. With the commander now dead, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Anderson took control of the remains of 45th Brigade and the other units around Bakri. On the morning of the 20th, Anderson was ordered to pull out of the Bakri positions and attempt to fight their way through to Yongpeng. A delay to the retreat whilst waiting for the 4th 9th Jats to join the column meant the 2nd 29th Australians were cut off from Anderson's position. About 200 men from the Australian battalion and 1,000 Indian men from the 45th Brigade were able to join up with the column. Other survivors of the 2nd 29th Battalion made it back in small parties. Two kilometres south of Bakri, Anderson's column was held up by a Japanese roadblock, which was only cleared after a bayonet charge led by Anderson himself. By evening, the column had only progressed five kilometres due to other Japanese roadblocks. Unfortunately for the soldiers, rest was out of the question, and although the passage south was now easier in open country, the men were laden with wounded, slowing progress. The 45th Brigade had practically ceased to exist. Most of the officers were either killed or wounded, including Brigadier Duncan and all three battalion commanders. Lieutenant General Percival commented that the young Indian recruits were helpless. They did not even know how to take cover, and there were not enough officers to control them. I say this in no spirit of disparagement. It was a penalty of years of unpreparedness for war coming out in all its stark nakedness. In late January of 1942, the Japanese advance down the Malayan Peninsula was seemingly unstoppable. Despite spirited defence, the Allied soldiers were suffering defeat after defeat as the Japanese pushed forward. After the heavy defeat around Bakri and Moor, the Australian and Indian soldiers of the shattered 45th Brigade fought their way towards the Parit Sulong Bridge, the only means of escape for the formation. Forward scouts reported that the bridge was in Japanese hands. The guards from the 6 Norfolks had been driven off and the important crossing points had been captured. On the 21st of January, the 45th Brigade, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Anderson, arrived at the Parit Sulong Bridge. An English-speaking Malayan informed Anderson that the bridge was held by the Johor military forces and led them forward with an escort. However, these men were being led into an ambush and found an emplaced Japanese machine gun post to the position, which wounded several of the party. The brigade then attempted to force passage through the bridge, but fighting raged all day and Japanese tanks, aircraft and artillery caused heavy casualties on the brigade. Later that morning, a message was received that a relief force from Yongpeng was heading out to help the breakout. Whilst the fighting on the bridge escalated, the rear of 45th column was repeatedly assaulted by infantry and tanks. Two soldiers managed to disable a Japanese tank using grenades and formed a roadblock, where more tanks were knocked out with the use of grenades and boys' anti-tank rifles in grim fighting. The forward elements of the column had been forced into an area of roadway about 400 metres wide. Anderson requested of General Gordon Bennett that an airstrike could be conducted on the Japanese defences of the bridge in the morning, along with an airdrop of supplies and morphine for the wounded. He received the reply, look up at Sparrowfart. In the evening of the 21st, the dead and wounded were piling up, and Anderson requested of the Japanese that two fully laden ambulances would be allowed to pass under the bridge and onto the Allied lines. The Japanese refused, and ordered the ambulances to remain in the road as a roadblock. The Japanese also called for the Allies' surrender, saying the wounded would be treated fairly. Anderson was still under the impression that help would be coming from the Yongpeng direction, and refused to surrender. 
The Japanese threatened to shoot the ambulances if they were moved, but Lieutenant Austin and another driver slipped the brakes on the ambulances, letting them roll silently back down the road. Under the cover of gunfire, they started the engines and then drove back to the 45th Brigade's positions. In the morning, RAF aircraft arrived, they dropped supplies on the brigade, and then started bombing the Japanese positions on the far side of the bridge. However, enemy tanks began their attacks on the 45th Brigade flanks, reducing the footing even more. Anderson probed the Japanese defences once again, thinking that the aerial attacks may have weakened them. Unfortunately, nothing had changed. Bennett sent another message telling Anderson good luck and that there was no hope of relief. The 45th were to withdraw the best they could. At 9am, the guns and heavy equipment were destroyed and the remains of the brigade began to withdraw east through the jungles towards Yongpeng. 150 wounded men were left behind, tended by volunteers. Of 4,000 men in the brigade, eventually around 500 Australians and 400 Indians actually made it through to Allied lines. The wounded, who had remained behind, were mistreated by the Japanese captors before they were then executed. The prisoners were beaten and forced into two small buildings on the side of the road, where the men were packed in so tight they were piled on top of one another. They were denied drinking water, and the Japanese soldiers brought buckets full of water, only to pour them on the ground just out of reach. The prisoners were then tied up in groups, pushed into the roadside scrub and machine gunned. Petrol was then poured on the bodies, some of whom were still alive, and they were burnt in an attempt to cover the scene of the war crime. 145 men were killed during this massacre, with many of the Indian soldiers being beheaded. One of the survivors was Lieutenant Ben Hackney of the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion, who managed to crawl away with two others, Sergeant Ron Croft and an English soldier, both of whom died over the next two days. Hackney managed to stay undetected for 36 days until a party of Malay discovered him. One of them, a police officer, turned him over to the Japanese at Parit Sulong. The Japanese then beat him. Hackney, however, survived the war and was able to testify about the massacre. And in the war crimes court in 1950, General Takuma Nishimura was sentenced to death for his part in ordering the massacre at Parit Sulong. Hackney was one of only two Europeans to survive. On the 23rd of January, the final act of fighting took place. Two companies of the 2nd Loyals covered the retreating column of the 45th Brigade and were attacked by seven tanks and two battalions worth of Japanese infantry. The Japanese infantry attempted to dismantle the roadblocks created by the Loyals and took heavy casualties as they did. But with no anti-tank weapons and vastly outnumbered, the Loyals eventually had to fall back. The fighting at Parit Salong was the end of the long period of fighting around Moa and Bakri. 45th Brigade had all but ceased to exist and despite local success, the Japanese advance had only slowed and not been stopped. General Percival blamed the inexperienced Indian troops, but they were facing the Japanese Imperial Guards, and they put up a stout defence against overwhelming odds. Arguably, 53rd Brigade was thrown into the front lines too quickly, having spent three months at sea in troop ships, and they were sent to their positions after only three days of arrival. Anderson was awarded the Victoria Cross in his part for holding the Japanese Imperial Guard at bay for four days and the Japanese concluded that the fighting around Muir was the hardest they encountered during the campaign, and it showed that the Allies could give as good as they got. However good the defences had been in places, it was clear that the Allies could no longer hold onto the Johor, and plans were made to evacuate to Singapore Island. After the Japanese victory at the Battle of Muir, the situation for the Allied forces in southern Malaya was looking desperate at the end of January 1942. Having been defeated by the Japanese Imperial Army in almost every engagement, Lieutenant Colonel Percival, General Officer Commanding of the Defence of Singapore, had decided as early as the 18th of January to evacuate to Singapore Island and hoped to stop the Japanese advance there. On the 24th of January, he issued an outline plan for such an evacuation and the units of West Force began a fighting withdrawal through Johor. The 11th Indian Division was pursued by the Japanese Imperial Guards, the 15th Infantry Brigade of the division was cut off at Renjit, but managed to escape by sea between the 28th of January and the 1st of February. The other two brigades of an 11th Division, the 28th Indian Brigade and British 53rd Brigade, crossed the bridge at Johor Bahru on the 31st of January to Singapore Island. The Australian 27th Infantry Brigade retreated down the Central Trunk Road pursued by the Japanese 21st Infantry Brigade of the 5th Division. The brigade had fought a well-conducted rearguard action and crossed to Singapore Island on the night of the 30th and the 31st of January. On the east of Johor was the 9th Indian Division, made up of the 8th and 22nd Indian Brigades. Pressed hard by the Japanese 9th Infantry Brigade, the 22nd Brigade was trapped by a Japanese roadblock on the retreat path. Rather than fight their way through, the brigade elected to attempt to continue their retreat through the jungles. 
For four days, they moved through thick and trackless jungle until they encountered another Japanese formation and surrendered on the 1st of February. 350 men were all that remained of the brigade. As the Allied forces were falling back through Johor, the Royal Navy had one last encounter in the campaign. The loss of the Prince of Wales and repulse earlier in the campaign meant that the Navy decided not to challenge the Imperial Japanese Navy for dominance of the South China Sea, and began building forces in Ceylon safe from Japanese attack. However, on the 26th of January, a Japanese force was spotted heading towards Endo, consisting of transports and an escort of a light cruiser, six destroyers and five minesweepers. The transports carried tools, equipment and personnel to build an airfield close to Singapore. This landing would have the potential to cut off the retreating Allies and also allow for air attacks on Singapore Island, so the Royal Air Force attacked the flotilla with everything available. Fifteen aircraft were lost, with only near misses caused on the ships. Responding to this failure, the Royal Navy dispatched the two ageing destroyers, Thanet and Vampire, to try to sink the transports. The Allied ships got past the outer ring of defences by hugging the coast. However, they were spotted at 0242 hours on the 27th of January by one of the minesweepers. Vampire launched two torpedoes at the minesweeper but missed, and the Allied ships continued searching for the transports for another 30 minutes. Before setting sail back to Singapore, the ships launched their final torpedoes at a Japanese destroyer. Japanese fire from a 5-inch gun hit Thanet's engine room, leaving it dead in the water. More Japanese gunfire sunk the ship with the loss of 12 men. 65 were able to evade capture and made it back to Singapore, while 32 were captured by the Japanese. These men were then turned over to the army who executed every one of them apart from a single officer. Vampire made use of smoke screens to return to Singapore with no casualties. As the last naval engagement was playing out, the Allied soldiers moved across the causeway to Singapore Island. The causeway was 1,100 yards long and 70 feet wide, and the withdrawal was conducted with no panic or congestion and being completed at A15 on the 31st of January. Yamashita had planned on destroying the defenders before they reached Singapore, and this was the best conducted operation of the campaign from Percival's point of view. Despite the continual movement on the causeway, the Japanese 3rd Air Division ignored it, and once the Allied soldiers were across, the bridge was then destroyed with help from the Royal Navy engineers using depth charges. The Japanese forces gathered across the straits in Johor, having captured the entire Malayan Peninsula in 55 days. As the Japanese moved into their attack position to reorganise themselves ready for the assault on Singapore itself, the Allied forces began preparing their defences. The plan was based on the pre-war concepts. This included defending the naval base from seaward attack, and it has frequently been stated that the defences for Singapore were all seaward and facing south. This is untrue, as the defence line in Malaya were also designed to stop an attack from the north, and the recent campaign had demonstrated this. However, the defences on the actual island had not been completed apart from a few scattered beach defences along the Jurong Line, which had been started but not completed. A force of 70,000 men were in place across the island, grouped into 38 divisions. All were demoralised and or poorly trained and equipped. Very few divisions were actually of full strength, and those that were had been bolstered by newly arrived soldiers who had yet to be tested in battle. Percival was unsure where the Japanese attack would land. He considered the likely location to be the northeast but the defenders could not rule out a Japanese sea landing, meaning that the entire 70 miles of coastline had to be defended. The defence plan would be to fight the Japanese landings, then counter-attack any which gains a foothold. This would be hampered by uncoordinated beach defences and the lack of any depth of defence, but it was a better plan than allowing the Japanese to land and fighting them on the island's interior. The garrison had an ample supply of artillery, 226 guns, including most of the coastal guns, despite the myth that they all faced seaward. The defence was split into three sectors. Guarding the northeast was the 18th Division and the 11th Indian Infantry Division. The western sector fell under the defence of the 8th Australian Infantry Division and the 44th Indian Infantry Brigade. The south was defended by the Malay and Volunteer Corps. Meanwhile, the Japanese forces moved into positions on the 31st of January. The 5th and 8th Divisions concentrated west of the causeway, while the Imperial Guard Divisions massed on the east. Yamashita was certain that the strongest defence position would be the northeast of the island, and he was correct as this is where Percival had placed 18th Division, his strongest unit. Rather than attack the best defence, Yamashita decided that the attack would fall on the sector between Tanjong Bulo and Tanjong Murai, which was held by the 22nd Australian Infantry Brigade. The attack would be conducted by the 18th and 5th Infantry Divisions, two regiments and a battalion from the 18th, with three regiments from the 5th. This amounted to 16 regiments in the first wave, with a further five in reserve attacking a line 4.5 miles long. Support was provided by the 1st Tank Regiment, attached to the 5th Division. Facing this on Singapore Island were three Australian battalions. The date of the attack was set to the night of the 8th and 9th of February, using boats, pontoons and collapsible dinghies to cross the straits. 
After the main attack had been delivered, the Imperial Guards were to attack to the east of the causeway. This would consist of seven battalions supported by tanks attacking the 27th Australian Brigade's positions. The latter part of the plan was hastily put together after Nishimura had complained to Yamashita that the Imperial Guards were being sidelined in the overall operation. The Japanese hid their preparations over the following week. The Imperial Guards built dummy camps on the northeast sector to hide the actual thrust of the attack, while holding practice attacks on Ubin Island, along with artillery preparations. On the west, where the actual attack would take place, the assault troops were not moved forward until the night before. The Australians opposite detected the activity, but by that point it was too late for any change in the Allied defence plans. The Japanese air and artillery barrage began on the morning of the 8th of February and rose in intensity against the Australian positions throughout the day. With it becoming obvious what was coming, boats were spotted in the Straits at 8.30pm. Australian positions were soon overrun by the huge numbers of Japanese attacking, despite stiff resistance. The scattered beach defences were easily penetrated by the Japanese and the lack of artillery support hampered the defence. Between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning, the forward companies of the Australians were forced back to their battalion perimeters through heavy terrain and with an unrelenting Japanese attack. The heavy losses suffered in this rendered the 22nd Australian Infantry Brigade useless. By the end of the first day, the defenders had fallen back to the Jurong Line and the Japanese had captured all their planned objectives. The next Japanese phase of attack opened on the 9th and the 10th of February. The Imperial Guards attacked across the Straits into the Australian 27th Brigade. Despite suffering heavy casualties from the Australian machine guns, the Japanese pressed the attack and forced the Australians into a retreat, which in turn opened a gap with the 11th Indian Division that allowed the Imperial Guard to advance unmolested. The events over the course of the day on the 10th of February showed the uncoordinated command that Percival was leading. The defence of the Jurong Line was a shambles. Due to the pressing Japanese attacks, units moving without orders and general confusion adding to the loss of the position. This was the last chance to defend the city of Singapore. Yamashita seized the opportunity for a drive on the city and gathered his forces of the 18th and 5th Divisions. The Imperial Guard were still crossing the Straits but were in a position to strike and cut the Western defence positions. As the threat increased, Percival organised a three-battalion force to protect the main road leading from the causeway drawn from the 18th Division. Wavell visited Singapore for the final time on the 10th and prompted Percival to order a counter-attack to regain the lost Jurong Line. However, disaster was unfolding as the Japanese smashed through the 12th Indian Brigade and an Australian battalion near the Tengar airfield, turning south when they hit the main road. That evening, they reached the vital road junction of the depots at Bukit Timar. As the Allied counter-attack was being organised, the Japanese 18th Division attacked down the Jurong Road and broke up any possibility of the attack going ahead. The Japanese attack was held, but a second Japanese assault smashed the 15th Indian Brigade and put them into retreat. Ammunition shortages caused the Japanese to stall in their attack and allowed for an Allied counter-attack at Bukit Timor. Three battalions attacked two Japanese divisions and the gesture was futile. Another force was assembled from the 18th Division to guard the reservoirs in the centre of the island and to protect the flank of the 11th Indian Division. The frankly terrible command and control in Allied HQ added to the Japanese pressure on the 27th Australian Brigade which moved south to the race course, exposing the 11th Indian Division's flank. This weakness prompted the commander of the 11th Indian Division to order that the naval base be abandoned and the division to retreat south. By the evening of the 11th, the defence line had closed around the race course and the McRitchie Reservoir. February the 12th saw the Japanese 18th Division attacking further down the Bukit Timor Road and the Imperial Guards capturing all three of the island's reservoirs. The Guard were also pressing on the north and northeast of Singapore City itself. At noon, Percival ordered that the defence fall back to circle the city in a final perimeter, and this was accomplished by evening. On the 13th, the situation was grim. The 22nd Australian Brigade had a strength of 800 men, while the 4th Indian Brigade fielded 1,200. Calls to resist were being issued from Allied HQs. On the whole, they were being ignored. Although the Australian 22nd Brigade did hold ground on the Holland Road, generally units were continually falling back. The Governor of Singapore gave orders that the radio station be blown up and the contents of the Treasury be burned. Soldiers in the rear areas were deserting, looting was reported, as were men trying to escape by boat from the port. In amongst this, the rubber stocks were burned and some factories demolished to stop them falling into the hands of the enemy. However, this was not universal and many factories remained intact. Percival held a conference with his senior commanders on the afternoon of the 13th. It was obvious that a counter-attack would fail and Heath and Bennett advocated surrender. Percival was not keen, although he knew that resistance would only last a day or two longer. That night saw the last seagoing ships leave for Java and Sumatra, carrying 3,000 evacuees.
On the following day, the Japanese 18th Division attacked again and came within 3,000 yards of the city outskirts, while 5th Division reached the residential outskirts of the city. That morning, Percival was informed that the lack of a water supply from the captured reservoirs had become a major issue. However, it had slightly improved by the afternoon, and Percival then indicated that he was willing to continue the defence. About one million people had crowded into the city seeking refuge, but they were subject to Japanese artillery bombardments and aircraft bombings, causing high casualties amongst the civilians. Later that day, Japanese soldiers entered the Alexandra Military Hospital after bayoneting a British lieutenant carrying a white flag. They began bayoneting the patients, doctors and nurses. Another 200 male staff and soldiers were led out into an industrial area and forced into unventilated rooms where many died overnight. The following morning, the survivors were bayoneted or shot. Only a handful survived by pretending to be dead. In the morning of the 15th of February, Percival held his final staff conference. The water supply would run out within 24 hours, and shortages of fuel and large calibre ammunition was equally dire. There was a choice between mounting a counter-attack to recapture the reservoirs, or surrender, and given that a counter-attack would have been impossible, it was decided that capitulation was the only course of action. Percival and his chief of staff met Yamashita at the Ford factory at Bukit Timor, and signed an unconditional surrender. At 20.30 hours on the 15th of February 1942, Singapore, the jewel in Britain's Southeast Asian holdings, fell into Japanese hands. It had taken 70 days from the landing in Kotsubaru. The Japanese captured more than 130,000 British, Australian and Indian soldiers who were subject to the most humiliating and degrading treatment, being crowded into Changi prison, abused and underfed. Many were shipped out to other parts of Asia as slave labour building railways, airfields and other military installations for the Japanese. Countless thousands died in this horrific treatment. The civilian population of Singapore also suffered for the next three and a half years, with the Japanese brutally treating the Indians, Malay and Chinese populations, the latter with particular disdain. In the months following the capitulation, Chinese males between the ages of 18 and 50 were rounded up, and those thought to have anti-Japanese feelings were driven to isolated spots and killed by machine guns or bayonets. The true number of men killed in this fashion is unknown to this day. Singapore was only liberated in September 1945, after the Japanese surrender in August. Yamashita was sentenced to death in the US war crimes trials, but was not charged for war crimes carried out during the Malaya or the Singapore campaign during his trial.